So hi, I'm Stephen Gray. I am a Google Developer Expert uh, for Maps, for Cloud, for IoT, for Assistant, you, you name it. I've been uh, in the Google Developer Expert program since 2013. Uh, I'm one of the longest serving GDEs. Uh, and actually, this is a bit weird for me uh, because this feels like a bit of a homecoming. Uh, I actually studied in computing science here at Glasgow about in 2001, and actually worked here as a research associate as well. So it's kind of weird to be back, because it's like everything has changed. Uh, but hey, this is, you know, this is, this is the life. And, but usually, and it's also funny, is because I usually do, so I, I work as a spatial software developer and a, a principal teaching fellow down at University College London as well, at the Centre for Advanced Spatial Analysis. And because I'm giving so many talks down in London, uh, people, I usually have to preface my talks by saying I talk funny and I talk slowly, but you guys have no excuse because you all should be able to. This is one of the first talks I've actually given back up in Glasgow, so my Scottish accent should be kind of quite thick and healthy. But anyway, so uh, yeah, so I'm going to hear talking uh, to you about Google Maps uh, and the kind of uh, different APIs that are out there that we can use for Google Maps. So, how many people in the room use Google Maps? Yep, okay, everybody. How many in the people in the room have used Google Maps APIs? Okay, so that's good. So we all know about Google Maps. We all know about the APIs. Uh, I'm gonna basically do a quick race through what we can do with it and show you some kind of cool things that you might not know, uh, but you might know, so please stop me if you have, but anyway. So, Google Maps is one of the interesting APIs. It was one of the first APIs that actually Google pushed out uh, back in uh, 2005. Uh, so we're now coming up to the 15th birthday of Google Maps. And being one of the first APIs, it's one of the longest standing APIs and it's one of the fewest actually uh, changed APIs around. So actually, we're still, even though we're 14 years in, we're still only at version three, which is interesting, whereas you know, TensorFlow at the moment is already kind of nearly predating that, so it's quite interesting. Uh, this is what the map used to look like back in uh, 2005 when it launched. Uh, does anyone remember this? This is quite interesting. This was, this was groundbreaking back in the day. This was like, geez, we've got slippy maps. Google Maps was the first uh, slippy map interface as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, the world used to consist of just the US, and it was a big deal when the UK uh, appeared just out in the ocean. But obviously now, it's a bit bigger, the world is a bigger place, and we actually have good coverage uh, of like, for example, Street View. We've got a whole load of kind of products inside of Google Maps that you can use. So this is actually the Street View coverage. Uh, the Google Maps API actually came out of, uh, it was quite one of these stories where it comes out of this kind of amazing kind of developer journey. You know, a couple of guys were hacking about with Google Maps and decided to create an API themselves and basically reverse engineered the JavaScript behind Google Maps and created their own API. Uh, and this was kind of the first kind of Google Map, although yeah, there's my phone going crazy because I'm saying Google all the time. Uh, <laughs> the problem about being an assistant GDE when you say, okay, Google, your phone goes crazy. Anyway, so this was the first uh, Google Maps API third party map where we can actually do something interesting and start mapping geospatial objects in the real world and putting pins down and creating interactive maps. Uh, but now we have uh, the sphere, the globe, it's quite amazing. We're actually now, uh, in modern day, we're rendering the maps uh, for the whole world in web in Maps GL uh, using the graphics card to do crazy things. I don't know if you know, if you actually scroll out in Earth, geez, my talks are always kind of peppered with like little Easter eggs from Google Maps, but see if you actually scroll out on the earth, uh, you can actually see the live cloud cover. So actually the, the clouds are rendered in real time. So when you actually zoom out and you look at the cloud coverage, you actually see the uh, global cloud coverage at that time. It's not just made up clouds. Uh, there you go. So yeah, so we've come a long way in the 14 years uh, and you know, you can use maps but actually it's more fame We're, I kind of do in my talks I try and get about show people what they can actually do with Google Maps to actually visualize their own data uh, and actually use the APIs 
Because a lot of people just think, you know, it's a map, I can put a pin in it, yay. Uh, but actually we can do a lot more with the actual APIs that we can actually do. And this is kind of the talk that I'm going to give. It's kind of show you all the different tools and show you some kind of really nice visualizations that people have actually created using the Google Maps API. So this is all of the different types of data classes inside the Google Maps API. There is a lot of them. This is actually all of them. If you can memorize this slide, then you're doing good. Uh, basically, the things I'm going to talk about are you know, map overlays, polygons, symbols, circles, geometry. So I'm only going to take you through a small subset of the actual API and show you what you can actually do with it. So we've seen these kind of maps. Uh, biggest problem is, I mean, the, the first thing, the hollow world of Google Maps uh, is to put a map marker on the page. But the problem is you get maps that look like this. Uh, does anyone want to know how many pins are on the UK here? You can't tell. You know, exactly. So the problem is, as soon as your data gets any big, you get maps that look like this, and they're horrible. And uh, as a professional visual data visualizer and a kind of spatial analyst, that is a horrible map. So you don't want to put all your pins on a map with looking at that, because even though you can interact with it and you can basically scroll in it, it doesn't give you a picture of what is being said on the map. So first thing you learn after you kind of do the whole world is you basically use custom map markers, okay? So you turn those kind of iconic I am here pins into little red dots, which makes it look a little bit better. But problem is it's still a bit cluttered, okay? So this is just basically replacing the pins and uh, just showing like a dot on the map, right? Then you get some things like heat maps where you take exactly the same data set and you just apply a couple of interaction, uh, a little uh, few magic API calls, and it turns your pins and your, your data rate into a nice, interesting heat map, which is quite lovely. So you can do things like that. You can also have GeoJSON data. So GeoJSON is a form of JSON object uh, for data, but it's holding geographical coordinates in it. And you can draw lines, polylines, on the map, and you can just literally call a GeoJSON file, and it basically draws lines on the map, okay? You can have TopoJSON. Now, TopoJSON is a bit different to GeoJSON. You've got it's basically topological data. This, uh, does anyone know what this is? Yeah? Shout it. Yeah, so yeah, so basically it's all the waterways and uh, basically water objects in the United States, okay? And you can get that from the US Ge 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 Geological Service, US Geological Service, and uh, they'll give you the top JSON, and basically you insert that data into your Google Maps with one little call, and you can start zooming in and seeing all the kind of interesting uh, map data that's on the the map, you also have symbols, so you can do like really nice animations, for example. I don't know why anyone would have an animation like that, but again, that's one of the examples out there. But you can do a lot of things with the data, right? You can start doing really interesting things. This one's quite interesting. It's basically taking the custom map marker, uh, turning it into a symbol, and then animating it over time. Now, this is, I love this visualization because any good visualization should be able to, you should be able to like, automatically see exactly what it is or work it out without any pictures, any text or anything around it. Does anyone want to have a hazard, a guess, of what this visualization is? Yeah? Spread of Walmarts. I, I, interestingly, hey, good man, top man. Uh, interestingly, I, I basically give this talk down uh, in London in front of like, my US uh, students and no one ever gets that it's the spread of Walmart. But you get to see that in the 80s, it kind of ramps up very quickly, and Walmart basically spreads like wildfire uh, across the US. So the, the, the green and yellow and orange dots are uh, historic sites. So they've been on the map the longest, and the red ones are where things pop up. So you see in the 90s, Walmart kind of spread from the center of America out like measles across the US. That joke usually goes down well better. Uh, down south, anyway. Uh, I'll just blame that you're tired. 
today. You know, it's Saturday, it's Saturday morning. Uh, anyway, so that's so yeah, so that's that's symbols on the map. You can get cluster markers, which basically takes all the pins and then starts rendering the pins as numbers. So you can actually start to see the density of the data. Uh, you can have spider markers, which basically, when you click on the marker, what happens is they kind of expand and they circulate. This is one of my friend George down in London. He basically built this library. Uh, you can take the map marker and have them kind of spiral around so you can actually see the data. There's lots of things you can do. But uh, I'm just going to take you through some kind of show you how easy it is to take that data and say, make a heat map, make the different visualizations, and then we'll get onto the good stuff later. So, for example, if you're ever using Google Maps API, the first kind of thing you have to do is actually call it as an API. This is the magic incantation that will get your uh, a map on the page with JavaScript. And then once you've got it, you basically type this libraries equal visualization. Now, this basically tells Google Maps to start loading the extra libraries that are in the back end. So you have a uh, visualization, you have a uh, geo kind of an an analysis. I can't get my words out this morning. Uh, that gives you extra functionality into the Google Maps API. So you might not see this uh, straight away. So you just literally put in libraries equals visualization. Although it's the American spelling, don't get that mucked me up for a good couple of weeks. They like their Zs, not their Ss and uh, that will bring in the tools. Once you've got that, you then just basically call an array which has your uh, lat longs. So this is just an array of uh, lat longs of objects on the map. This is, this is just your standards, what you would load your uh, mark, map markers for, on the page with. It's again, it's exactly the same. Once you've got that, you then uh, just call this magic little incantation, if I can if my functionality, basically var heat map equals heat map layer, and you basically tell it where the data is, and this time we're just basically passing it an array of uh, markers, and then at the very end we basically say, for this heat map layer, just stick it on the map. You know, this is the map object, stick it on the map. And that's it. Easy. Two seconds later you get this really nice uh, heat map image in San Francisco. Uh, so it basically gives a, a richer experience than just having your map markers on there, just having your single points. Now, there is time in, uh, the time and the place to use map markers, but if you want to just get a quick overview of how the density looks of your data on a map very quickly, you just basically pull in that and you can toggle the map uh, markers on and off and you get the lovely heat map. You can then pass it a gradient uh, object which is just literally uh, colors that goes from kind of warm to cold. And then you just call heatmap.setGradient, and next thing you know, your greens turn into blues, okay? So you have a lot of control over the data and how you actually picture the data on the map. Uh, and it's really easy. It's really, really quite simple to do. Uh, and then finally, if you want to make it a wee bit bigger, you want to make the, the radius a bit bigger of your points, you call set radius and whoa, it gets a bit bigger and a bit more dense. Now, that is, that is literally the full controls of heat maps. So now you can take your, your markers on the maps very quickly and then turn it into a heat map and have a more richer visualization, a richer experience for your users, and you get a better overview of the data that you're looking at. Uh, it's pretty simple, pretty powerful. A lot of other people, other things they might not know is that you can actually style the map up to however you want it to look. So Google Maps, it's great. And the point, if you're, you, know, you go to the maps.google.com, you get the standard slippy map that everybody sees. But that might not go with the style on your website or your mobile phone app or whatnot. You may have your kind of cu custom color themes. And this is where map styling comes into important. If you've got data uh, that you want to basically put on the web, you want it to match their styling. You want the experience to match how your website looks. You don't want just a standard map. And your data might call for that. You might want to actually have a richer uh, color contrast between the data that's on your markers or your heat map and, for example, this is London. You know, This is what the standard map will look like. If you add some magic JSON object, 
uh, in as a gray styles, and you basically add it to styles equals gray styles, next thing you know, your map looks like that. So it's exactly the same map. You've just tweaked a few things with a JSON object. Uh, it looks very complicated because there's a lots of complicated data on uh, the maps are hard. I should point that out. Uh, well, that's what I tell everyone so that they basically pay me more money. Uh, but you know, you can actually control every single object that's on the map, and you can actually tweak it to the point that it's visual, it's, it's visible or it's not visible. Again, all this is showing is you have this magic visibility equals on or off. There it is up there, visibility off. Now that basically tells the map renderer to turn different objects on and off and what styles to make it. And you can then, for example, take all the, the I've just taken all the labels off the map with just by turning it on and off. So I mean, it, you can instantly see that's London. Well, if you live down in London, you know that's M25 around London. And, but you can now start letting your data sing, let your data do the telling rather than the map just being cluttered and you can show different things. I don't like using those JSON objects because, well, we have to use the JSON objects, but again, I don't like using it to tweak the map. I am not that, that geeky when it comes to actually going for every single thing and doing it manually. So there's lots of really good uh, tools out there. So this is the Google Maps uh, V3 style wizard where you can actually just go and turn all the roads off or turn the landmarks off. You can use a visual a tool to actually style up exactly what you want your map to look like. Uh, so there's that. Uh, there's also another tool by Aaron Chen uh, called the Google Map Customizer, which allows you to go through each feature, turn the colors, make, like, for example, if you wanted to make the seas green for some strange reason, you could just basically go and select a uh, feature water and then say that you want it to be the hex color of that. And it will then give you the JSON object that you stick into your map and Bish bash boss, you've got a styled map. If you're really, if you're really like me, and actually you just want to cheat, Snazzy Maps is a really good resource where a lot of professional cartographers have actually already went on there, did the hard work for you, and you literally can go for free, search for the kind of style of map you want, and you literally download the content, uh, the JSON object, and you've got that really nice styled map. There's about, I've used this about nine times out of 10 to actually just get the style that I want on my map to like my data thing. So that's how you actually do it. If you want to do something a bit more advanced, you can do, as I said, you've got GeoJSON. Uh, GeoJSON is literally just a feature collection, right? All it is is a JSON object uh, that has uh, geographical coordinates or features inside of it and has some metadata around it. So for example, this is a GeoJSON file for the uh, London Tube network. And the show is basically these features. You've got, for example, your name equals Victoria line, the color of the tube network, and the geometry over here of the line string. So this is the, the, the crazy coordinates of the tube. And the really nice thing with Google Maps is if you literally just say where the file is, so you basically just tell it load GeoJSON and you point it to the GeoJSON file and you just hit refresh, like, just like magic. Or you can set some styles as well, but just like magic, it just turns up and it just loads the data straight in from the data file. So you don't have to do any parsing of the data. As long as it's a valid JSON file and it's got coordinates in it, Google Maps handles everything for you and it just loads the data in straight away. And then you can get to the magic job of styling it and making it all pretty. Uh, this bit of code uh, basically extracts the color out of, so if you see the kind of third line down, it's, it extracts the color of the line. Uh, from the GeoJSON, so we're not saying, we're not, we're not pulling any data away from our actual data source, we're just using that as our kind of truth of knowledge. Um, and we're just basically saying to Google Maps, look, I want you to override the line color at a certain point uh, and uh, show the line color. And as if by magic, you can basically turn your Harry Beck tube map of London into an actual ge geographic geographically correct tube line. Did anyone realize that's what the tube line in London actually looks like? And it's not like, I mean, you guys know in Glasgow, the actual circle line isn't really a circle. But anyway, there you go. So you can actually style up the map and you can do some really nice things uh, and pulling out the data in real time. And you can do mouse in and mouse out. In this example, which is on my uh, GitHub, 
you can just scroll over every line and it will turn it into the color that you want. So you can actually do dynamic uh, rendering of the data in real time. So that's GeoJSON. And then if you want to get really complicated, you can do custom geometry. Now, this is taking you back to your maths days and basically working out how to draw shapes onto maps. Uh, drawing shapes onto maps is really hard, actually. Uh, it uses code that looks crazy, stuff like that, where you actually have to compute distances between different objects and actually drawing things onto maps and trying to work out exactly where the point starts and where it ends and computing the distance on a spherical object. There's no flat earthers in here, are there? We live in a globe. You know, so you have to work out, you have to work out the spherical differences, the spherical joins. You have to do some complex math to actually work out how to draw objects. But once you get the like really crazy math around uh, to try and draw those objects on the spherical uh, globe, and you can then use this one function to say, hey, I want to basically set this layer with these complicated geographies on there, and then draw on the map. So. You have this set map equals map. That's your magic incantation that allows you to do really interesting things. And so you end up getting hexes on a map. But interestingly enough, even though I am a special developer, I've been doing this maths for a long time, I still get it wrong. And even when you draw intersecting objects onto the, onto the map, you can start to see by the time you get down to the corner here, I say, I should use my magic thing. When you get down to the corner here, you can actually see how the distances between the objects up here don't match down here. So you actually have to pay attention into really, if you're doing these complicated uh, drawing of objects onto the map, you have to get the math right because actually when you start looking at uh, large spatial areas, the, the, little, the little bits and the floats will start adding up to big changes by the time you get to the bottom of the map. I don't know what that is. We've got, got a drum beat, you know? Anyway. Anyway, it's, it's fine. They're, they're gone. We actually, we used to, total aside, we used to uh, practice on a Saturday with the Glasgow Uni Wind Band just across like two halls down and I was like half expecting there to be the, the, Kel the Kelvin ensemble starting playing this morning. But anyway, they're not, so that's good. Anyway, that's just a side, sorry. Uh, so yeah, so back to maps. Uh, <laughs> you basically, when you're drawing custom geography, you have to be very careful of what you're doing. So I would basically say, don't do it. And I'll show you a really good trick of a tool to use in a minute to basically do that kind of crazy stuff. But bringing it all together, bringing all that stuff together, you can create really powerful experiences. And so here's two websites that I found that are really good. This is a taxi, a NYC Taxi. NYC Taxi is basically from a public, uh, one of these uh, public uh, requ freedom of information requests in the US. They basically got all the taxi journeys uh, for a year within uh, New York. What they get, this guy did was he basically pulled all that data together inside BigQuery, which I'm looking at schedule, we'll be getting a talk later about how to use BigQuery to, to basically unpick these really large files uh, very quickly. But with BigQuery and Google Cloud in the background, what we would be able to do is pick out random journeys for one taxi cab every reload and every refresh of the map and actually start looking at, say, the running totals of where the pickup of all those pickups and drop-offs are in real time. And so therefore you can see a day's worth of fares, a day's worth of passengers, how many people this cab has picked up. And using the Google Maps API actually rendered all of the journeys from beginning to end. So you can get this really compelling uh, visualization of the journey of one taxi driver out of a whole year's worth of data. And this, all, all the computing happens in real time when you load up the map. So it basically goes and picks up a journey, does all the computing in real time, and then visualizes it in Google Map in this really nice little kind of visualization which shows you where the, whoop, nearly fell off the stage there. It shows you the pickup and the drop-offs uh, of one taxi driver, uh, and this was back in 2013. And you can load another taxi, you can load stuff. It's a very good app. I've had many a day of just watching what taxi drivers in uh, New York do. Uh, that was a quick, that was a very, very quick journey of that last one. Anyway, 
Uh, and then you've got a visualization that looks like this. This is all of the uh, boat movements in the US uh, for a particular period of time. And you have different types of boats, you have different, uh, it's just like planes are broadcasting their positions in real time. Boats are doing this as well, and somebody's collected all that data and basically visualized all the movements of all the planes, oh, sorry, all the boats. Uh, so you start to see like the big ocean liners that are transferring. You also see how there's lots of, I mean, uh, I usually have smaller things, but down here is the Panama Canal. So you can actually see how many people actually use the Panama Canal to, for the cargo ships. I think the blue one is uh, fishing, the red ones are commercial, and uh, I think these are like uh, fishing boats out in the US. I'm not too sure, could be wrong, don't know. Anyway, but it shows you actually the activity and in real time how to actually visualize this data. So it's a really nice, compelling visualization that's taking that experience of taking all those data points, loading it in real time and putting it on the map. But this is the kind of crux of my talk. Uh, you know, everyone thinks mapping is easy. You have, we, back to the point, what happens when you've got millions of data points? What happens when you've got too much data to load in? We all know with the web, you know, you don't want to be downloading gigabytes of data to then over the web to then visualize that data and then watch your little laptop or your uh, machine explode, trying to render that on a slippy map for you to visualize. It's more common than you think, but you know, this is what you do if you have too many data points. So going back to this map, what is very interesting, this visualization was the first kind of pretext of actually using the GPU rendering. Now, in Google Maps API, uh, we are still stuck with uh, the old-fashioned vector, uh, sorry, the old-fashioned tiling methods of actually displaying data on the Google Maps. The actual maps.google.com website now uses vector maps and has more kind of GPU optimizations let's say it that way, to actually render the experience in real time. On the API, we don't have that yet. And so this, uh, these guys, as part of Google I.O., they basically started looking to see how they could use the GPU to start rendering points on the map so that you can use the power of your GPU and your computer to actually do some interesting visualizations. Uh, and this was the first kind of experience. Only problem with this, 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 this visualization, there isn't any interactivity on it. There literally is just you know, a map that you have to fix on this location. If you move that map, you lose the visualization. So that's not really what we want to go for, because we want it still to be interactive. And when you load all these points on the map as well, what happens, you get this experience of where your laptop heats up and basically goes thermonuclear and starts burning through your table. Uh, and the experience just becomes completely unusable. Uh, I have seen maps like this. This is kind of crazy. Never make a map like this. You will kill people's browsers. You will kill your own patients when you try and render it. And when you're still waiting 10 minutes later for all the data to actually appear on the map, and you're thinking, what's happening? Your users won't like that either. So uh, there was a big gap in Google Maps for a good number of years where if you had too much data, you couldn't render it. You had to be very clever how you basically pulled that data off of, uh, say, Google Cloud or your backend services to actually visualize that data. Now, what then happened, we had other kind of tools in the, uh, open, um, the open maps uh, spatial data platforms like uh, Layer and uh, OpenStreetMap. Uh, we had tools like Deck. GL. Now, that is a vector visualization tool base that allows you to basically load uh, vector, sorry, yeah, vector data on a vector map. But Google Maps wasn't vector, so we're like, ah, what happened? So actually, this year, we actually got inside Google Maps API a deck.gl extensions to actually allow us to use the power of deck.gl to render the data on Google Maps, uh, which I'm like, thank, finally, because I can give talks like this. Uh, and we're, I'm just gonna take you through it. So actually, DeckGL uh, basically is a layer-based approach with WebGL uh, technologies in the back end to allow you to do these custom overlays in Google Maps API and sync, the, and more importantly, sync the data between the maps 
layer and the actual uh, data so you can actually use it customly. Now, uh, Uber created these libraries and here is an example for it. This is, oh, I just got a shock off my laptop. Too much static electricity up here. Well, I can find my, my thing and I can just click on this. This is, no, that's the globe in real time. But if I just pull over my, ah, where's my, where does my mouse go? There it is there. I'm trying to get a mouse over here. Do, 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 do. There we go. This is all, this is uh, one of the first maps, dot, Google Maps with DebtGL uh, data on it, which is showing you all of the locations of all of the trees in Paris. So each one of these data points is a tree inside Paris. And you can actually start seeing that we can actually, all powered with the, uh, uh, with the GPU on my laptop, you can start seeing that there's no, there's millions of data points here, but there's no lag on the map. You can start seeing I can mouse over different types of trees and it shows exactly all the trees rendered in real time. And if I reload it to prove that it's actually doing it in real time, there you go. It just loaded the data from a CSV file, stuck it on the page and used my GPU to actually quickly visualize that data. And how this is basically done is that the web deck GL, the deck GL layer is sitting in the background, attached to the Google Maps, and they're keeping each other in synchronization so you can start doing really complex visualizations and really big visualizations, like all of the trees in Paris, for example. This would have been impossible uh, a few years ago until the kind of marrying of the uh, very visual. You can do millions of data points in real time using big, you know, using the data tools like BigQuery, like uh, the kind of Google Cloud uh, database services to load the data into the map. Uh, but it's just so damn easy because to get all that data on there, it used to be codes, like pages and pages of JavaScript just to get the kind of two synchronizations. But now all you need to do is you take your Google Maps incantation at the top, you basically add deck.gl at the top with another line. And once you've done that, you take your maps and then you literally just point it to the data. So for the moment, that is where the trees data is, is in GitHub. It's a good, I think, I think the data is about uh, 50 odd megabytes of CSV, which is a big file. Uh, and then using this one little bit of code, you're basically visualizing all the trails, trees in real time. So it's so powerful and you, you literally just call a new deck.googlemaps overlay. Uh, and then basically I use a scatter plot layer. I've loaded the data in from the data file. Uh, basically set the position, oops, wrong one. Set the position with uh, get position up here. And uh, showed the latitude and longitude from the data file. Worked out the radius of each of the points that I wanted to put on there. Basically, Gave it a function to say, hey, I want to, a tooltip to appear when you mouse over it, and then show it where to get the colors from. So I've got a function that just does exactly the same thing that the data inside the heat maps does, and then you get a nice, lovely map as well that works uh, very beautifully. So that is it. Literally, if you want to visualize lots of data very quickly in real time, you've now got the power of uh, the, the, the back end to do that. Now I just wanted to, oops, where's that, where's, where's everything gone? Ah, there we go. Uh, I wanted to show you quickly this, uh, now I'm hoping that the demo gods are with me today. Demo gods, where are you? Please make this work, because I don't want to end my presentation. There we go, it's here. For some reason, Keynote loves to uh, basically open a new file every single time. So here is basically uh, some examples of using the OpenGL layers inside of Google Maps. Uh, this is someone has put all these demos are up in GitHub. Uh, I'll, I'll share the, the slides. Uh, sorry, I'll share the uh, links at the end. And somebody has basically taken, for example, all of the trips from one airport uh, near Chicago 
and shows all the linkage between, all the regional linkage between this one airstrip with the other airstrips around the Chicago area. So you have like, the, you know, just as you had before, you know, you've got you know, all these points, it's all in 3D, so you can do arc lines, for example, like this. And what's kind of cool with the arc lines, they're all transparent, so when you overlay the arc lines on top of each other, just, it's just a point of origin and destination. But when you overlay all the lines together, and because they're just slightly, uh, just slightly uh, translucent, when they overlay, you can start to see where the most common frequent trips between the two are. So it's a different type of visualization, but you can see the aggregation of the data. But what is really cool is these are actually arc lines. And if you zoom in very close, you can actually see that they're in 3D. So, oops, we've gone too far. Blah. But basically, as, you, as you're moving about, you can actually see how all these are in 3D. And they're actually arcs from one position to the other. And these are being computed in real time uh, on my laptop. So you can actually see that it's doing uh, the real-time computation. It's loading the data in from uh, the external data source, and I'm doing nothing with, a, I'm doing nothing underneath the hood with that data. All I'm doing is I'm loading it. The Google Maps is taking care, uh, and the libraries are taking care of the loading of the data for you, and all you're basically telling Google Maps is, I, this is how I want to visualize it. I want to use either a scatter block and arc, a trips inside uh, deck GL and it will just visualize it for you uh, knowing basically how it, to work it. So this is all the trees in New York. Now interestingly enough it doesn't show you the trees inside of parks. It's only like uh, sidewalk trees or pavement trees but you can see it's a really large data set and you know you can basically you know zoom in and out in real time and there's no lag because it's using the GPU to render it you literally can just you know, render all of the trees in New York very quickly, and it's using the GPU to calculate its position and keeping both the Google Map and the layer uh, in synchronization, the vector layer in synchronization. Trips is a really nice one. Uh, that basically is taking, uh, this is uh, trips from uh, taxi cabs in, I think, I want to say San Francisco, yes. Uh, yeah, San Francisco. And it shows you basically, you can do the kind of uh, visualization that uh, happens in the New York cabs. Uh, it's all up on Google Maps, a uh, uh, GitHub page, but you can basically tweak it, tweak the lines, show how, basically how to go from point A to point B. And again, it's only a few lines of code to do this. As long as you've got the data in the right format, you can use these examples and render the data. Uh, and this, so you can actually get these really quite powerful maps that were quite complicated to do a few years ago, but now it's just a few lines of code. And I fi fi finally, in this hexagon, you can do 3D hexagons. I, like, I really like this. Uh, you can basically render the data if it loads. Come on, loading the data. This is probably the good example of uh, why you want little spinners. So you can have these 3D hexagons that show values rather than like the cluster markers of the heat map. You can basically do the aggregation of all the data uh, as hex uh, and extrude the hexes out of the globe. And what happens is you get this really nice visualization where you can have these hexagons that are slightly translucent and you can start going through them, which is quite cool. So you can start to see exactly if I had a, if I, if I had a scale in there, I could actually see what the data was showing. But you can start seeing that these are 3D objects on a two-dimensional slippy map, and they're all keeping in real time. So it's a bit of a different way of doing the aggregation that you would potentially do with a heat map, uh, but on a slippy map, and you can start seeing the actual underlying map underneath it. So it's pretty cool, but that is a deck GL. So a couple of lines of code. Uh, and you can get the power of uh, the GPU visualization with your data without having to basically worry about loading the data in over the web. You don't have to worry about how the, all you need to worry about is how the data looks on your map. Uh, all the hard stuff is done for you. And being a lazy coder, that's what I like. Uh, if you want to find out more, these are all the links. If you want to take photos, these two slides are the best. Uh, slides to take pictures of, so I'll hold, I'll hold, I'll hold for this slide after I see all the phones coming down. See, I, I'm a developer just like you guys. I know exactly when people want to take photos and when they don't want to take photos. 
That's the first one. Everyone got a photo of that? Everyone in the live stream, hello. We're just taking photos. It's all right. You know, you guys can do screenshots if you want. Uh, there's other, other slides if you want to see some of the examples. Uh, if you want to see the DEC GL examples, they're down there. Uh, and all the backgrounds I've done are from the, the Chrome Earth view extension, which I really like. So I've got a few more slides just towards the end. You have to be very careful. So this is my caveat that I give all, to all my students. Data visualizations can lie, so you have to be very careful about what you're actually doing. For example, these are two unbiased news sources in America called Fox News. Uh, they basically are using visualizations to basically be biased. You have to be very careful with uh, watching how you present data. Again, maps lie very easily, and these are more legitimate maps that I have found out in the web. So for example, Cannes, France, did you know, is in the top of France. Uh, Strasbourg and Toulouse are over Italy. Uh, I, uh, did you know London, for example, is in Norfolk? Uh, if you go to CNN and uh, look at these maps. So it's very easy to lie with maps. It's very easy to make differences. So you have to be very careful when you're visualizing your data. Uh, again, maps lie. This is a really bad image. But basically, this is Apple. They basically took Greenland and Iceland out of the map. So you have to be very careful about your source data and what you do with your source data. Google Maps is not. Guilty, it's very guilty of this. This was happened when Jura basically disappeared. So there was apparently for a good couple of weeks, there was just a road in the middle of the ocean off, off of Scotland. Uh, so yeah, so you have to be very careful because people use maps as a point of truth. So when you're visualizing data on map, you have to be very careful about how you visualize that data because it can be used for different ways. So even though I've given you the, the shown you all these powerful tools that you can use, you have to be very careful about how you use them. And you've just kind of, this is XKCD, you know, when you're using heat maps, for example, just watch, for example, you're not just recreating population density maps, because here are three different maps, basically, it's just showing where, where people live. And if you go and look at visualizations on the web, where it comes to maps, you most likely find that you're just visualizing where people live. And it doesn't tell you anything extra to what the data actually says. So be very careful with how you do that. Uh, use the tour, you know, with, with great power comes great responsibility, uh, as a famous movie said. Uh, but you have to be very careful. So just take that with you. If you're going to use Google Maps, uh, if you're going to use this in your kind of exploration of visualizing data on maps, uh, just take that with you and obviously get feedback from people uh, before you put it on the web because you could be into the point that you're just telling lies with your maps or you're basically telling untruths that can be used different ways. So just be careful out there. And just because you have the data and you can map it doesn't mean you should map it, OK? So with that, thank you. I will, if you, need to, if you want to contact me, this is the way you can get to me. I'll be sticking around until about 3 o'clock today. So come and see me, but thanks very much. <laughs>